hoping that silence is the enemy. That praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. All right, come on. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we praise you Oh We praise you Oh Come on, let faith Let faith be the song that overcomes the raging sea Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me Let it rock let it rise, let faith arise. Let's sing it out, church. we we'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh. God to be our vision. We want him in focus. So let's sing that out to him. Be thou my 
our wisdom. You're so good. We just want to focus on you and your presence right now. God, help you to be the focus of our lives. You are so good, God. So right now we surrender to you. We surrender in this place. We push aside everything that might come in the way of you, God, because you reign above all else, God. So we just want to stand here in your presence and we just want to be in your love, be surrounded by your love, God. We love you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone. You can go ahead and grab a seat. My name is Brock. I'm a member of the serve team here at the Chapel Nordonia. It's my privilege, my joy to uh, welcome you here this morning. Uh, if you are a guest, uh, especially a first-time guest, I want to extend a warm welcome to you. Uh, you can uh, stop by our Next Steps table after the service. Um, you can uh, grab some more information about the Chapel Nordonia, who we are, what we're doing here in the community, as well as uh, find ways to get plugged in if you're looking, you know, for a, a Bible study to join, small group, or just figure out how to fellowship with uh, other believers here in the Chapel Nordonia community. Uh, getting plugged in has really been a blessing uh, to myself and my family. Uh, this week I was at the men's group. And we were going through Ephesians, and we talked about how God chose us, uh, redeemed us, and has equipped us for everything uh, for his purpose. And like I said, it's just been a huge encouragement to uh, me and my family, and uh, I encourage you guys to, to really get plugged in. All right, well, I got a couple announcements for you guys. Um, May 29th is no longer our Vision Sunday. That's going to be moved to June 5th. Uh, at the Vision Sunday, uh, we got uh, exciting news about the vision of the future the future vision for the chapel in Ordonia here. So you don't want to miss that. That's June 5th. 
Uh, May 29th is still going to be an exciting service because that's going to be our first outdoor service. So it's still going to be here at the YMCA. Um, it's going to be popsicle themed. It's going to be a, a family service. So there's no children's ministry that day, but it is a, a family service. So please come and join us for that. Um, giving, there's, there's multiple ways to give. If you're a member of the Chapel Nordonia, all the ways should be listed on the screen behind me. Uh, if you're a guest, please feel no obligation to give. But through these uh, gifts and ties, we were able to do amazing things here in the uh, Chapel Nordonia community, uh, down at, at Camp Carl, and uh, throughout, you know, Northeast Ohio and around the world. It's, it's pretty amazing what God can do uh, through giving. A um, couple prayer requests. Mika Jackson's student was admitted into the hospital uh, for fluid on her brain, so let's keep uh, that, that student in prayer. Logan Romanini is also having surgery on May 31st, so we want to uh, keep her and her family lifted in prayer. Uh, pray for the hospital staff, protection over Logan, wisdom with the hospital staff, and just pray that, you know, they feel the presence of the Lord through this through this whole thing. Uh, last, we got an exciting birth announcement. Sam and Darlene Strickler welcomed Madeline Patricia into the world on May 11th. They actually delivered the baby on the way to the hospital. I uh, could not imagine that. <laughs> I know how stressful those rides could be. And giving birth on the way, uh, that's just amazing. So uh, the mom and baby are doing well. Uh, just keep them in their in, in your prayers uh, as they, you know, welcome uh, this uh, new baby into the world. So um, shifting gears, today is Name Amnesty Sunday. If you realize everyone's wearing a name tag and we're wondering why that is, it's Name Am Amnesty Sunday. So we have a little prompt for you guys today to get people talking. Um, I want you to talk with your neighbor or somebody around you that you don't know and uh, tell them what your dream vacation is. So uh, my dream vacation, well, I got a lot of dream vacations. I love to travel. So uh, probably top on my list would be the Maldives. I want to, you know, get out there and see the, you know, clear water, uh, white sand and all that good stuff. So that's my dream vacation. And uh, you guys can go ahead and share that with the people around you. And you'll know, oh, yeah, stand up and share that. And then um, you'll know when the time is done when Chapel News comes on. So, all right. everybody. My name is Anna Marie Noble and for the record my dream vacation is going to Will and Decayla's house in Kent. Welcome to another Name Amnesty Sunday here at the Chapel Nardonia. If you are a guest with us today I want to welcome you and thank you for spending the morning with us. You can visit our next steps table in the back for more information on who we are as a church and ways to get plugged in. As most of you know every Sunday a dedicated group sets up and tears down our services so that we as a church family can all worship together. There are two teams that rotate four weeks on and four weeks off. We are in need of just a few more people to join these teams in order to make the morning run smoothly. If this is an area you would be willing to serve, even if it's just for the summer, it would be an incredible blessing for our church. If interested, please contact either Will or Tequila Rasper and they will get you set up on a team. No experience or knowledge of our equipment is necessary and thank you in advance. Another area that has recently opened in our church to serve is our website design team. The Chapel Nardonia now has the ability to update and run our own website, but we need a few helping hands in the process. If you are tech savvy and would like to serve in this way, please reach out to our campus administrator, Dekayla Rasper. Our summer VBS registration is open. VBS will take place in the evenings on June 19th through the 22nd. Check out this short video on how to register your students. Good day, mates. Welcome to Zoomerang. Oh, good day, mates, and welcome to Zoomerang. Today is an exciting day because VBS registration opens. If you'll follow me over here, I'll show you how to register. All right, so once you scan that QR code and in your invite card, and it'll take you to this screen that you see here. And we have two different sections. We have family information and we have student information. You're going to need to fill both of those out. And if your child has any food allergies, you're going to gonna want to click on this button right here and you can list those out in this detail box. Same thing goes with this medical concern form. You can fill that out right here. And then this is really important right here. We have a payment details section. Um, there's a drop down box. You're going to click on this and you have two options. You're, it's Either I will pay from the confirmation email or I'll need help paying and we have scholarships that we can offer you if that's the case. And then you're actually gonna pay in the next screen that I'm gonna show you. 
But in addition to that, there's another drop down box right here, and it's an option to purchase a student 2022 VBS t shirt for an additional $8. So you're gonna wanna click on the size, and then you're gonna hit register student right here. So as soon as you register your student, you're gonna get an email as well. Great, my student has been registered. And then you're gonna click on this link. This is really important. You're gonna wanna click on this link, and this is gonna take you to your payment page. Now you need to either submit your payment or check that scholarship box in order to finish your registration. And then you can either pay just $7 flat for the registration fee, or you can pay 15 total if you check the box that you'd like a t-shirt. So once you do that, you're gonna hit check out here, and you're gonna go to this screen, and it's gonna have you enter your card number, and you can finish paying. You'll hit submit, and once you do all that, your child is officially registered, and we will see them at Zoomerang. And just one additional reminder, if you have multiple students that you need to register, you're just gonna wanna do this whole process for each child individually. Well, we're so excited. Registration for 2022 VBS is now open. Grab your laptop or scan that QR code and grab your sunnies. Grab your sunnies. That's your sunglasses and your mates. Those are your friends. And get ready for a fair dinkum time at Zoomerang. <laughs> I'm so excited for Zoomerang and I hope you are too. Speaking of VBS, we are having a training day for our volunteers on May 22nd next Sunday at Boston Heights Friends Church where VBS will be located. If you are willing to serve on our VBS team this summer, please plan on attending this meeting. And that's our list of announcements for this week, so thanks for tuning in. Bye! Well, we're so excited for VBS, and we can't see, wait to see how God is going to work through that. Um, at this point, we're going to dismiss our chapel kids, and uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that today's sermon has some sensitive topics that we're going to be covering, um, but there's going to be age-appropriate uh, programming in our chapel kids' classes. So we're just going to stand together, and we're going to continue to worship because our God is worthy. Sing I once was lost. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel too. to see how God is going to work through that. Um, at this point, we're going to dismiss our chapel kids, and uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that today's sermon has some sensitive topics that we're going to be covering, um, but there's going to be age-appropriate uh, programming in our chapel kids' classes. So we're just going to stand together, and we're going to continue to worship because our God is worthy. I once was lost. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel too. me first, I would refuse you. 
Jesus is my life. Oh, 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 everything. You are our life. You are the giver of life. And Lord, we praise you because of who you are. We might have come in here this morning weighed down by the difficulty of the past week, and we just want to surrender that all to you today. Lord, we want to lift up those who are weeping at the senseless tragedy in Buffalo yesterday. You are the comforter that gives peace, that passes all understanding. And so, Lord, while we don't know why certain things happen in the world, we know that you are in ultimate control of it all. And so for that, we praise you and say, hallelujah, all we have is Christ. You are our life, and we're so thankful for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you guys can have a seat. It's good to be here with you today. For the record, my dream vacation is actually Antarctica, believe it or not. Told somebody that and they said, ew. But uh, if you want to know why, you can come ask me after the service. But if you have a Bible, go ahead and open to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is where we're going to be today. Uh, if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you, my name is Chase. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as lead pastor here at the Chapel Nordonia. So excited to be with you. And we are in the fourth week of a five-week series uh, about family, a series that we've called Family Matters. And, and when I started this series off uh, three weeks ago, um, I, I said that this series might as well be called Colossians 3 because we were going to be in Colossians 3 every week. And we've barely been in Colossians 3 since I said that. And today is no different, so we're actually going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians. As I've been studying these topics, uh, and specifically this topic, as we're talking about uh, singleness this morning, the more I've realized that we can't just box ourselves into Colossians 3. And so that, with that said, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And so let's read together from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 6. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, just because I think that's helpful for the wording for this topic this morning. It says, starting in verse 6, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. 
He says, I say this as a concession, not a command, but I wish everyone were single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried, just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. Jump down to verse 25. Now regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married, I do not have a command from the Lord for them. But the Lord in his mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I will share it with you. Because of the present crisis, I think it's best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it's not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it's not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles. I'm trying to spare you those troubles. Verse 29, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very, very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them, for this world as we know it will soon pass away. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who's no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and, and holy in body and spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. But if a man thinks that he's treating his fiancée improperly and will inevitably give in to his passion, let him marry her as he wishes. It is not a sin. But if he has decided firmly not to marry and there's no urgency and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who marries his fiancée does well and the person who doesn't marry does even better. Father, this is a, a difficult passage, one that's been mistaught in the past. And so, Lord, I pray that you will give me clarity this morning. Will you speak through me? May any word that's not from you simply be forgotten. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we've been an established church plant now for about 20 and a half months. I kind of talk like it's a baby. Eventually, we'll switch to years, but about 20 and a half months. And so I feel like by now, you guys know a lot about me. And, uh, and maybe you know this already, but one thing you may or may not know is that I love swimming in water. I don't know why I said in water, like you could swim in something else. But I, I love swimming. I love snorkeling. I, lo I love going to the beach. I just love being in, in water. And, and while I love snorkeling, the one thing I do not like, the one thing that terrifies me is the thought of snorkeling or even just swimming in open water, like where I can't see the land at all. That just terrifies me. Some of you are keeping track. You're like, okay, he's got a fear of rabbits. He's got a fear of open water. This guy's a little strange. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, but but scuba diving is something that I've always wanted to do, and I was looking into scuba diving, and I found this out recently, that divers, when they're diving at night or in deep, dark places where the sunlight doesn't reach beneath the surface, it's not uncommon for divers to become disoriented and experience what's called diver vertigo, where you lose track of, being, of, of which way's up and which way's down. Okay, so, so uh, again, open water terrifies me where you can't see the land. Now, if you add this element onto it where you don't know which way is up and which way is down and you're in complete darkness, there's nothing but uh, a thin piece of plastic between you and an ocean's worth of water, and you're swimming in a certain direction, and you think you're swimming up, but you could be swimming down even farther, or you could just be swimming parallel to the water, whichever way you don't know how to get to the surface. You don't know if you're making any progress at all all while this pressure of ocean weight weighs heavily upon you. 
Well, I have to imagine, and I say this with humility and respect, that this is how it sometimes feels to navigate the waters of singleness and dating as a Christian in 2022. That is the weight not of water, but as societal pressure is mounted upon individuals to marry, and maybe you find yourself surrounded by what seems like an ocean's worth of dating blogs and books and apps and websites from within the church and from without the church. And I can only imagine that at times, for those in these waters of singleness or dating, it must feel similar to a diver who wants to get to the surface. Whether that surface is marriage or a fulfilling life of singleness. But yet, you find yourself as one diver described, buried under millions of gallons, unable to see anything at all, not knowing which way is up or which way is down. Now, if you're here today and this describes you, then I have good news and a confession. Okay, the good news is that the Word of God does not leave us hanging on the topic of singleness. And today we're going to dive into the Word, uh, as our, using the Word as our guide through these murky waters. But, but my confession is that I have little to no experience with this at all. Okay, Amanda and I, we met our freshman year of college. We were dating by the end of freshman year of college, engaged by junior year, married right after college. And here's the craziest part, we didn't even go to a Christian college, right? If we did, we probably would have been, you know, three kids by junior year. But anyway, uh, (laughs) uh, but so I, I can't speak about what we're talking about today from personal experience, uh, but from biblical, uh, from being helped out by what's in the Bible. And so this message today, I want to say as well, uh, for the preparation of this, I leaned in heavily to several of my friends in ministry, men and women, both from my time in seminary, who uh, are either single, dating, or went through long periods of singleness while longing for marriage, or whose ministries are primarily focused with those who are in those seasons now. So I said, I just, you know, messaged them and said, hey, I can't speak from this experientially. I can speak biblically. Uh, but I want to share this with you to see how it will be received. And so I'm so thankful for their wisdom, and hopefully you'll benefit uh, from them even more than me this morning. That being said, uh, like I said, we're going to use the Word as our guide as we dive into these murky waters of singleness. And so here's our outline this morning. I want to show you in Scripture a countercultural observation, a divine reflection, and a not-so-easy solution. A countercultural observation, a divine reflection, and a not so easy solution. That's our outline for today. And I have one point for all three of these, and then the last uh, point has three sub points. So that's our outline today. So, first, the countercultural observation. So, the book of 1 Corinthians, which we read from earlier, was a letter written to a place in Corinth. And it was written for two reasons. Number one, there was a person named Chloe in the church in Corinth that had reported to Paul about several of the problems that were going on in the church. We don't know if Chloe was a male or a female. Today, Chloe is primarily, uh, primarily a female name, but back then it could have been either one. But Chloe told Paul about a bunch of issues that were in the church. And then second, Paul wrote the letter of, of Corinthians to this church because he was also getting a bunch of letters from people in the church about particular issues within the church. And so here in chapter 7, Paul pivots from what he had been talking about up to this point to addressing the specific letters that he, would, that he had received. That's why he starts off in verse 1 of chapter 7 by saying, Now concerning the matters about which you, were, you wrote. Concerning the matters about which you wrote. And while he addresses a, serious, a, number of, a series of issues for the rest of the chapter, he starts by focusing on marriage. That's why many of the headings... Uh, for this chapter in your Bible may say principles for marriage. And marriage was a a, a complicated topic back then, even more so than now in ancient Roman times. The Romans believed that there were four types of marriage, believe it or not. They had what was called uh, the contubernium, which means a tent companionship. Uh, This was usually the type of marriage uh, that slaves took part in, and so it meant it could be legally broken up at any time by the masters. But at the time that this was written, uh, many of the early Christians were slaves. And so many of them had lived or were currently living in these types of marriage. The second type of marriage was called us-us, similar to what we call today common law marriage. And this was the type of marriage where people could be declared husband and wife after they had lived together for a year. 
The third type of marriage was called uh, compito in manum, which was when the father would actually sell his daughter to a prospective husband. Uh, this was more than what we would consider an, an arranged marriage. It was usually for business or political reasons, and it still exists in many parts of the world today, but thankfully not in our society. And then the final form of marriage, and this was the most prestigious kind of marriage, was called the confar confariatio. And the wedding ceremony here uh, was similar to what our modern wedding ceremonies look like. In fact, the modern wedding ceremony is largely based off of this one. Here's a few examples. During this ceremony, there would be a matron that would accompany the bride, a man to accompany the bridegroom, so the maid of honor and the best man. And they'd have the exchanging of vows, the wearing of a veil by the bride, uh, the giving of rings placed on the third finger on the left hand, uh, a bridal bouquet, and a wedding cake. Okay, so the church has attached biblical meanings to all of this, uh, but the roots of what we see in the marriage ceremony come from ancient Roman times. Okay, now, now to add to the confusion here, divorce was way more common in those days than it was today. In fact, one commentator said, it was not uncommon to see men and women who had been married 20 times or more. And on top of this, so you have this going on in, in Roman culture, then in, in Jewish culture, from a Jewish perspective, to be seen as unmarried at this time was on par with sin. Okay, so the traditional Jewish believers actually saw that it was a sin for an adult man to be unmarried and for an adult woman to be childless. Okay, so uh, th as this new church is forming, and, and it's a church with Jewish believers and Gentile believers that are coming together in the midst of this secular Roman culture in which marriage and sexuality are both devalued and over-elevated, you can imagine that Paul received a lot of questions. And so we had to address this uh, these divisive issues that had crept into the church, similar issues to what we look at today, issues of marriage and homosexuality and polygamy, but also unique issues like the growing belief that one was made more spiritual by being married and remaining celibate. Okay, so, so this was the common belief that was in the church at the time. And so Paul, in this chapter of Corinthians, he starts by addressing these issues that were raised about marriage, but what's interesting is that he doesn't stop there, but he goes on to strongly recommend singleness, which is why uh, I don't actually like the heading given in the ESV in most of our English Bibles uh, where it says marriage. It's talking about marriage, but it's also talking about singleness because Paul here is not only addressing marriage matters, but singleness matters. And he's not only saying that marriage matters, but he's saying, and this is our first point, that singleness matters just as much as marriage and in many ways can be more beneficial than marriage. Okay? How, how countercultural is that? In our world that, that treats singleness as simply a waiting period, right? When, when singles are told that their singleness can be used to help married couples navigate their busy lives because it's assumed that those who are single have more time and less commitments. When, when subconsciously those who are single are seen by many as not yet married, Paul steps in and says, no, no, that's not the case. In many ways, singleness, not as a means to an end, but as an end itself, is actually more beneficial for the kingdom. Now, as I say this, I think that this can be received in two ways. For some of us, specifically those who have been married for a long time, we can easily fall into the category of hearing this as a truth without recognizing that this, this fact, this, this truth, brings with it the burden of difficulty for our single brothers and sisters who do long to be married, and our single brothers and sisters who recognize their calling to a life of singleness but feel neglected by the church. And as a married church family, we have to lament the part that we've, that we've played in this. Because for far too long, the church has treated singleness as a problem to be solved instead of a calling to be celebrated. My friend Christian Williams, a woman's director at a church in Arkansas, she recently posted this on Facebook about her experience as a single woman in the church. She said this, she said, if we actually believe that wedding rings are not varsity jackets in the kingdom and us singles are not simply trying to put in enough work in our off season to make the starting lineup, then we actually need to be a people who cultivate safe space to ask a, ser a scary question, what does it look like for me to remain unmarried? Hey, what's she getting at here? She's getting at the reality that, that for many, if not most in the church, we see that those uh, who are not married as having reached 
uh, we, sorry, we see those who are married as having reached the ultimate standard of life, while those who are unmarried are simply putting in their prayer work and hours until God brings them the man or the woman that they're looking for. That's why, if I may say so myself, we see so much assumed matchmaking going on in the church, right? From married men and women towards unmarried men and women. Now, you all know who you are at home with your spreadsheets of all the single people in the church. And, and, and while you may be doing this as a, uh, an attempt to be helpful and maybe to see uh, yourself being used by God to bring people into a union that glorifies him, more often than not, whether we realize it or not, we're doing this because we see singleness more as a problem to be solved than a calling to be celebrated. On the other hand, many of you who are single may be thinking, great, this is another message about how I should just be happy about my singleness and how that's a gift and how I should celebrate it, but my desire is to be married. Right? How can we wrestle with the fact that singleness matters just as much as marriage and in many cases is more beneficial than marriage when you do desire to be married? Well, this brings us to our second point. A divine reflection. Let me reread the first verses that we read earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. Paul says, Now as a concession, not as a command, I say this, I wish that all were as myself. In other words, he's saying, I wish that all were, were single like I am. But each has his own gifts from God, one of one kind and one of another. So what's he saying? Well, well, again, this is in the context of answering questions about marriage, specifically matters of sexuality within marriage in the verses right before. And so he's saying, look, look, those of you who, who are married, uh, you know, do, do what you do. But if it was up to me, I wish that everyone was unmarried. He says that God gives gifts, different gifts to different people. And so to some, he's given the gift of marriage and to other, the gift of singleness. And one of the ways to know that you have not been given the gift of singleness is if you cannot control sexual urges. That's what he goes on to say in verse 8. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Okay, now we'll come back to this at the end, but let me say right away, this does not mean that anyone who is single or even anyone who has been given the gift of singleness does not struggle with sexual sin. In the same way that many of those who are in the covenantal commitment of marriage still struggle with sexual sin. No, what Paul is saying is that this is a concession. Okay, not like a concession stand, but like he's conceding. The, the Greek word is syngonomai, syngonomai. And it's used in other places in antiquity to, to say, I, I say this to meet you halfway. Okay, so Paul's saying to meet you halfway. Marriage is good, and if you're, and if you're, uh, if you're not being married is going to cause you to stumble, then you should get married. But singleness has its benefits as well, and I personally wish that you all were like me. We don't know for sure whether Paul was married at any point in his life. Many people, self-included, believe that he was married earlier because in the book of Acts, before his conversion, he appears to be a member of the Sanhedrin uh, when he was a Pharisee, and he's talking about uh, how he was a Pharisee of Pharisees in the book of Philippians chapter 3, how strict he kept the law. And remember, if you were a good religious Jewish person at the time, then that means that you would have had to be married. Uh, but many people believe that his wife either left him or that she had died at some point. And this is the view that I hold to, but uh, Scripture doesn't say with certainty, and so there's room for disagreement. But regardless, at the time of writing this, Paul is single, and he speaks of the benefits of singleness in the chapter. Look at what he says in verse 32. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. In other words, he's saying, listen, my, my ultimate goal is to free you from the things that are holding you back, the things that are causing you to worry and stopping you from serving the Lord to the fullest. And he goes on to say that marriage can actually be one of those things. He says the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife and his interests are divided and the unmarried and betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. Now again, I have to note what he's not saying. Okay, he's not saying that if you are married, even if you came to faith after you were married that, that, and your spouse is uh, not a believer, that you can say, uh, you know, this whole marriage thing is holding me back from serving the Lord. I think I should leave because my attentions are divided. No, he addresses that earlier in verse 12 when he specifically says that if you're married to an unbeliever, you shouldn't leave. 
It says if the unbeliever walks away from the marriage, that's another story, but believers should not walk away simply because their spouse is an unbeliever. So if you're currently listening to the words of Paul and you're married and thinking, man, Paul's making the single life sound pretty good, just full stop right there. Okay, don't let your mind go down that road because that can lead to all sorts of trouble. But I do want to pause here briefly just to acknowledge that both single and married people can feel trapped. Right? The pain of feeling stuck can come in different ways. Singles can think, if only I were married. And married men and women can think, if only I hadn't married him or hadn't married her or hadn't married at all. And while the old saying says the grass is always greener on the other side, I do just want to sit just for a second in the reality of that, uh, that all of the stuff that we're talking about in this Family Matters series, marriage, parenting, singleness, it, it's, it's hard. Right, Pastor Valmir and I stand up here and we talk about this stuff and, and, and some that haven't had to wrestle with the reality of the family matters that we're talking about, maybe it's just words. But to the mother up late worrying about her wayward son as we talk about parenting last week, or the husband who's trying to figure out how to recapture the spark in his marriage as we talked about marriage a couple weeks ago, or the man or woman in their 30s and 40s and 50s or beyond who are trying to figure out why God has not given them a spouse yet, these messages are more than words but reality. And the reality in this room, the reality is that in this room, many have soaked the pages of their Bibles and journals with tears during their prayers, and the answer that God has given them is not yet. And if that's you today, I want you to know that God sees you and that God loves you, and that we as a church want to walk through this with you, even if we haven't experienced it ourselves. But in the waiting, as difficult as it is, what all of us need to realize, whether we're single, married, or dating, is that, and this is our second point, singleness illustrates the fact that the Christian's union with Christ is our ultimate identity. Singleness illustrates the fact that the Christian's union with Christ is our ultimate identity. In our day and age, there's so much confusion and vagueness and even controversy around words like identity but for the Christian, there should be no confusion that the most important identifier about who we are is that we're in Christ. Right? That before we were saved, we were outside of fellowship with the Father. We were far from God, but now, like we talked about in week one, where our lives are hid with Christ. We're in Christ. And this change, this union that we have with Christ, this is the most important part of who we are, and it's beautifully illustrated in singleness. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you remember that we looked at the hot button verses in Ephesians 5 that say, wives, submit to your husbands, and husbands love your wives. And we said that those verses are only controversial because what's being missed in the dialogue and often intentionally skipped is that these verses are not calling for the, oppress the oppression of, of women within marriage, but that in the marriage relationship, the submission of the wife and the love of the husband points to the submission of, of the church to Christ and the love of Christ to the church. And so the husband's and wife's call to love and submission in marriage actually paints a portrait of the love of God and the church. And what Paul is saying here is that within singleness, we can actually see a portrait being painted of the perfect relationship between God and mankind. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20 in verse 34. Here, Jesus is being questioned by the religious authorities. They're trying to, trying to trap him and ask him this crazy question, right? They, they don't, they're asking a crazy question about what happens after the dead are raised, and they're just trying to trap him because this is the group called the, the Sadducees. They don't actually believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so in Luke 20, they come and they ask Jesus this crazy scenario about what happens if there's seven brothers. Okay, the law of Moses talks about that if, if uh, the oldest has a wife and his wife, or and he dies, uh, then the next in line has to care for his wife and marry his wife. And so they ask him this, this question. They say, "Hey, what if there's seven brothers, and the oldest dies, and so his wife goes to the second, uh, but then he dies, and so she goes to the third, and then he dies, and they keep going all the way. You can tell they're just trying to trap Jesus. And so they say, so who's she going to be married to in heaven?" And here's how Jesus responds in Luke chapter 20, verse 34. He 
It says, And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to the age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry or are given in marriage. What, what does that mean? Well, I think the New Living Translation helps us again here. He says, marriage is for the people here on earth, but in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. O okay, so, so what this shows us is that there will be no marriage in heaven. Okay, that might be surprising to some of us. I love my wife. Can't imagine life without her as my wife, but what this passage clearly communicates is that we won't be married in heaven. That doesn't mean we won't know each other in heaven. Doesn't mean that we won't still have, you know, a special close relationship in heaven. Doesn't mean that she won't still be smarter than me in heaven. She probably will be. In case you didn't know, Amanda, I'm brag on her. She was the top of the class in college. I was the top of the class in philosophy because I was the only philosophy major in college. Okay, so I'm fully expecting Amanda to be smarter than me in heaven, but our, our relationship won't change in that, we, that we'll probably still know each other, but in some way, and I don't think we can fully wrap our minds around this until we get to heaven, in some way our relationship will be different in heaven than it is now. One commentator says this on these verses. The fact that there's no marriage in heaven implies at least two other things. That there'll be no procreation in heaven, the number of redeemed is set, and with no death, there's no need to, uh, to, to propagate the race. And number two, there will be no sexual intercourse in heaven. The appetites and desires of this world will give way to a higher and indefinitely more gratifying delight in the world to come. So, so, so what does this mean? It means that in heaven there still exists an intimacy that's greater than sexual intimacy, which is seen by our culture and our society as the ultimate form of intimacy. Like, like, is sexuality not the primary pursuit of our culture? Right, in the ads on TV, the explicit scenes and movies that are usually unnecessary to the plot, the thriving pornographic industry that brings in tens of billions of dollars a year, the only thing that's pursued more than sex is maybe money, and that comes with the understanding that if you have more money, then you can have more sex. And so everything around us screams that sexual expression, whether outside of marriage, whether between a man and a woman, or two men and two women, or a number of each, that that's what brings the ultimate fulfillment. But what Jesus says, who he himself was, was never married and so never engaged in sex, what he's saying is that there won't be marriage in heaven, and therefore, because sex was created to stay within the confines of marriage, there won't be sex in heaven, because stay with me here, because marriage itself is only a picture of our relationship with Christ. And so when we're in heaven, that illustration will no longer be necessary because we'll have a true and unbridled relationship with Christ above all else. Brothers and sisters, when we sang the the song that we just sang a second ago and said, oh, Father, use our, my ransom life in any way you choose and let my soul forever be my only boast is you. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Well, when we sang that, did, did we sing those words just as empty, hollow wishes to a God in the sky who may or may not be listening? Did, did we sing those words, but did we really mean, you know, I, I have Christ, but I also have my family and my kids and my health and my wealth. Well, when we sang those songs, were we implicitly declaring, I have Christ, but I'm so thankful for uh, th that he gave me all this other stuff that I cherish just as much. Because the words, all I have is Christ, should cause us with fear and trembling to come to the humble realization that our pursuit of sexuality or if our pursuit of marriage or even if our pursuit of raising healthy children, if any of that is, of our, is above our pursuit of Jesus, then brothers and sisters, we've stumbled into the realm of idolatry. Because again, nothing and no one matters more than our relationship with Jesus. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 that in many instances, it is better not to be married. Not because not he's just dogging on marriage, but because he's saying that marriage and children and the difficulties that come with both can actually in many instances distract us from the reality that all we have is Christ. And for that reason, singleness illustrates the fact that the Christian's union with Christ is our ultimate identity. My friend Rebecca Scott 
one of mine and Amanda's closest friends from our time in Dallas, she says this about the subject of singleness. She says, singleness can come with a burden of difficulty, but it's also a resource for th- that the church is neglecting. And by resource, I don't mean free babysittings on Fridays. I mean that single people function prophetically to remind the church of her esch- eschatological destiny. That means our, our end times destiny, our, our heavenly home. Single people remind the church that she is a stranger and an alien and that her whole life in this world is to be one waiting for her bridegroom, which is Christ. So it's important not to only sympathize with their plight in an over-sexualized world and church, please do, she says, but also to call the church to see, to see rightly that their single siblings in Christ, to see their single siblings in Christ and to perceive the meaning of their lives. So, so do you see what she's saying here? She's saying that just, like the, that, like just like Paul tells the church in Ephesus and the church in Colossae, that marriage provides a graphic picture of the relationship between Christ and the church and who God is, Paul is telling the Corinthian church that singleness provides a picture that says that the Christian's ultimate identity and ultimate fulfillment is in Christ alone. So a countercultural observation, singleness matters as much as marriage and in many ways can be more beneficial than marriage. A divine reflection, singleness beautifully illustrates or reflects the fact that the Christian's union with Christ is our ultimate identity. But we still have yet to answer the question, how does one navigate the murky waters of singleness and even dating for that matter? Which brings us to our third point, a not so easy solution. And here it is. Both married and unmarried men and women in the church must seek to image God in all of our relationships while equally valuing the gift of the other. Let me say it again. Both married and unmarried men and women in the church must seek to image God in all of our relationships while equally valuing the gift of the other. This takes us back to a couple weeks ago, right? In Genesis 2, where we said that humanity was made in the image of of God. There's something that separates humanity from the rest of creation. And so as a quick side note, you know, while it's funny at times to to joke about our pets as our children or to even dress your pets up in animal clothes, I'm not judging at all. Well, I'm just a little bit. But but while that's all fun and games at times, like what we have to remember is that there's a firm distinction between animals and those that are made in the image of God. And again, jokes are jokes, but there's a fine line between joking about our pets being our kids and churches of which there are many in our neighborhoods and communities that baptize their pets. And even one church in our area this past Easter that advertised the option for kids to baptize their stuffed animals. And I don't say this at all as an attack on any church, but to simply say that we must be careful even in our joking to maintain a firm distinction between that which was created by God to be ruled over and that which was created to rule lest we fall to the Romans one way of thinking and begin to worship the creation over the creator. But when we remember that all of us, single, dating, married, divorced, remarried, widowed, all of us were created by God to be his image bearers across creation, and we add on to that the fact that uh, that those who are married reflect the relationship of God and the church, and those who are single reflect the perfect relationship between God and humanity in all of eternity, then we realize that God has uniquely positioned all of us to display a unity and a light that the dark world we live in cannot ignore. So how do we do this? Well, I have three sub-points under this final point, and I'll go through them quickly. Number one, married and unmarried men and women, equally valuing the gift of the other, will result in a renewed value of celibacy. Let's revisit the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 8. Paul says, To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Okay, as, as we said earlier, he's not saying that no single people will ever struggle with lust. And he's not saying that marrying is the end-all magical cure to lust. He's simply saying uh, that sex outside of marriage is wrong, and so for those who cannot control this, they should marry so they don't fall into sinful behavior. But this does not mean that those 
who do not marry and are not married uh, do not struggle with sexuality and, and urges. Our, our culture, as we all know, leans heavily against this view, right, that marriage or that sex is confined within the boundaries of marriage because sexuality is seen as an individual choice without the need or a, a mention or a consultation of, of what God says. Right? There's an underlying aspect of individual body autonomy that goes with this where people say, it's my body, I'm going to do with it whatever I wish. Now, I should clarify, I'm not talking about the child autonomy process that Pastor Valmir wonderfully laid out last week. But even in that process, while our children grow up and we realize that our children do not belong to us, and they grow up becoming their own, uh, their own adults and impacting their own generations, even in that process, we should teach them that like the Heidelberg Catechism says, even when they grow up and leave their house, they are not their own, but belong body and soul to Jesus Christ. And so while outside, while the outside world looks in and says, you know, it's your body, do whatever you want with it, the church says, no, it's not our body, right? It's God's. But the church has often also taken Paul's teaching so far in the opposite direction that they say that Christians, especially young Christians, should hurry up and marry, marry simply for the sake of having a God-honoring sexual outlet. Okay, both of these views are not in line with the, what the Bible teaches. Paul's not saying that Christians should hurry prematurely into marriage simply for the sake of sex. And this is why when I was joking earlier about uh, how it's surprising a man and I were dating and, and married right after college, even though we didn't go to a Christian college, there's a hint of truth to that. Because far too often what we see, especially in Christian circles, is that those who are looking to have, quote, a ring by spring, right, are, are hurrying into potential un ungodly unions simply because they're taking Paul's words out of context. And maybe we'll dive deeper into this at another point, but it's, it's an undeniable, heartbreaking fact that there seems to be a pipeline among young people in the church into what I'll call a hormone-driven marriage to an early divorce, to shame and isolation, to apostasy. And much of that is driven by a misapplication of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7, 9. But no, what Christianity teaches is that both our bodies and our sexuality are subject to the morals and ethics of Jesus, and therefore surrendering of what seems like a, and is a natural urge in a desire to obey and follow the teachings of Jesus is nothing short of commendable and should in fact be celebrated. Right? Celibacy for the sake of obedience should be celebrated. I love how one of the early church fathers, John Christostom, a uh, fourth century theologian, he puts it like this. He says, but the celibate one, on the other hand, has no remedy to extinguish the sexual fire. They see it rising to a crescendo and coming to a peak, but lack the power to put it out. Their only chance is to fight the fire so that they are not burnt. Is there then anything more extraordinary than carrying within one all of this fire and not being burnt? In other words, he's saying, look, look at those who are committed to living lives of celibacy for the sake of obedience to Christ and to God's word. They still have a sexual desire, right? It doesn't mean uh, th that they, they don't wrestle and they don't struggle, but it also doesn't mean that they should simply just throw all the teachings of Christ out. And it doesn't mean that they should simply get married as fast as possible. No, no, he commends those who are fighting fire with fire. In other words, they fight temptation with the power of God himself because, as one commentator said, nature is no match for the Holy Spirit. We've got to keep moving, but we can't speed through this conversation about celibacy without mentioning our brothers and sisters in the church who are attracted to members of the same sex. Okay, you hear what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about men and women who have sacrificially surrendered their desires and laid them before the throne of God and said, Lord, I don't know why you gave me these desires, but I want to live my life the way that you want me to. And what's absolutely heartbreaking is that these men and women are not only ostracized by others who have the same desires in the, sec in the secular community, because, of course, the world says fighting against your desire is wrong, but they're often ostracized from the church as well because the church ignores and doesn't know what to do with and fails to support those who have surrendered their sexuality to Jesus and committed their lives to celibacy. In her book, The Significance of Singleness, A Theological Vision for the Future 
of the Church, which is a great book uh, by Christina Hitchcock. I could have just stood up here for an hour and just read from that book. Uh, But she's talking about our our culture's obsession with sex and blatant disregard to the commands of Scripture and even the church's overemphasis on marriage as the ultimate form of completion. And here's what she says, and I'm paraphrasing for time and for our context. She says, It's no surprise that the church struggles to find a a cognate response to homosexuality. As Christians, we believe that that homosexual sex is forbidden by Scripture, Yet we are often left feeling like hypocritical moralists who deny others what we ourselves enjoy. Any coherent biblical no to homosexual marriage must be accompanied by a true and humble yes to singleness and celibacy. Any church that says no to homosexual marriage, which we must, must work to support those living lives of celibacy in such a way that even lifelong celibacy is not only possible, but fulfilling, valued, honorable, purposeful, and embedded in community. Uh, I love that. That's, That's so good. Married and unmarried men and women seeking to image God above all else in our relationships while equally valuing each other will result in a renewed value of celibacy. Number two, the last two are quicker. Married and unmarried men and women equally valuing the gift of the other will result in a deeper theological and understanding and appreciation of friendship. Okay, again, we could spend a whole other sermon just talking about this one, just, just talking about friendship. But let me just say this. Our culture knows almost nothing about true, authentic intimacy between two people that's not sexual in nature. Right? The loving friendship shown between Jonathan and David, who were both married but had deep, uh, a deep, close relationship, is it's almost awkward to read that now with our 21st century cultural lenses. Even the relationship between Jesus and some of his disciples has been wickedly held under scrutiny by many. But church history gives tons of examples of church fathers and other Christians who care deeply about real, intimate, non-sexual friendships between believers. There's a weird notion today that friendship ends when the wedding ceremony begins. Of course, there's wisdom in establishing boundaries between married men and single women or single men and married women in the same way that there should be boundaries set up between married men and married women. Not because the other is automatically perceived as a threat, but in order to guard our hearts from temptation. But marriage should not eliminate deep, authentic, life-giving friendships between the married and the unmarried. Let me say that again. Marriage should not eliminate deep, authentic, life-giving friendships between the, the married and the unmarried. I was talking to a friend of mine earlier this week in preparation for this message, and he was uh, single into his, into his late 30s, and he said that one of the most life-giving aspects of his singleness was when his married friends would simply invite him to things with their family, not so that they could babysit, not so that they could be the awkward third wheel, but because they genuinely enjoyed fellowship together. And so he said as a word of advice to, to married couples, invite your single friends with you on family vacations. And again, not so that they can babysit, so that you can fellowship together and you can celebrate the success of life together and lament the sorrows and ultimately you can have a deeper theological understanding of friendship. Rebecca Scott, who I quoted earlier and who actually wrote her seminary thesis on the topic of friendship, she says this, she said, this when we were talking earlier this week, she said, local churches have a wonderful opportunity to literally and imaginatively celebrate people. Yet these celebrations are almost always tied to married life. Wedding and baby showers, wedding ceremonies, anniversaries, kids' birthdays, etc. She says, we need some similar formal celebrations when it comes to single people. Why can't a single person have a shower when they move into a new apartment? And for a few single people, after careful discernment, they may want to have a ceremony, committing themselves to celibacy, and to the people God has given them. There's lots of room for creativity. She also gave uh, two book suggestions, her and another friend of mine, uh, and they should be on the screen behind me. And one's called Made for Singleness, uh, and then the other one's called Seven Myths About Singleness. I've heard these two books come up in conversation several times, so if you're a reader, uh, you can get these books. I haven't read them, so I can't endorse the books, but I endorse the people who recommended these books. 
And so if you want to get the books, and I'll get them, and we can read them and talk about them. Number three, married and married men and women, married and unmarried men and women, equally valuing the gift of the other, will result in a pursuit of Christ above all else. A pursuit of Christ above all else. This is why I said it's not an easy solution. Because while it's easy to claim uh, to pursue Christ above all else, denying oneself, especially with regards to sexuality, is not easy. And so maybe you're here and you're single and you're thinking, look, I get all the stuff you said, singleness is a gift, but uh, I, I just know that I'm not called to singleness. All right? Good on those who are, but, but it's not me. I, I want to get married. I want to meet my spouse. And I'm, I'm battling against, against the flesh, but I know that God has not called me to a life of celibacy, and I'm trying to figure out what in the world am I supposed to do. Well, this brings us back to where we began. The divers, right, buried under millions of gallons of water, unable to see anything at all, not knowing which way is up and which way is down. How do those divers actually make it back up to the surface? Well, they feel for the bubbles. See, when it's black as far as they can see, and the divers don't know which way to go, they begin to feel with their hands around for the bubbles because bubbles always move towards the surface. And so when the diver is so disoriented that he cannot trust his feelings and he cannot trust his judgment, he knows that he can still trust the bubbles. Friends, we may have came here this morning, whether we're talking about singleness or or we have our own marriage problems or problems in our own personal lives that maybe have nothing to do with family matters. And maybe we also feel this way, trapped and disoriented. We don't know which way is up or how to take our next step or how we can get to the surface, whatever that means for us metaphorically. Well, my advice for you is simple, yet it's immensely difficult. It's the easiest thing I can say, but it's the, easy, it's the most difficult thing we can implement and learn, and that's that in the same way, divers follow the bubbles to the surface, simply live lives in a pursuit of Christ above all else, and he will take you where he wants you to go. He will take you where he wants you to go. Not necessarily where we want to go, but where he wants you to go. And what are those bubbles for us? Well, it's a life of daily seeking Christ and following the commands that are explicitly spelled out to us in Scripture. See, see, this is where our faith meets our reality. Because, again, it's easy to say this, and it's easy to even say amen to this. But we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to completely surrender our lives to Jesus? Married unmarried, single, dating? Are we willing to say with our whole heart, God, you do what you want with my sexuality. You do with what, what you want with my family. You do what you want with my marriage. You do what you want with my children. You do what you want with my singleness. You do what you want with my health. You do what you want with all of my family matters. Are you willing to say this with your whole heart? Because a life following Jesus and pursuing Jesus may not get you to your intended destination on this side of heaven, but it will get you so much better, and that's a life that culminates in the presence of Jesus hearing the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, and that's a life worth living, even in the most difficult moments. As our worship team comes back up to lead us in one final song, I want to close with the words of Jesus from the Matthew account of the conversation that he had with the Sadducees that we talked about earlier. In the account in Matthew, Jesus goes on to talk about the seriousness of of marriage and how seriously it should be taken. And he gives three different groups of of those who are single. He uses the word, in Matthew, he uses the word eunuch. uh, But what he's really talking about is what we would call today celibate. So three, three groups of those who are celibate. And here's what he says. Well, first, here's how the disciples reacted. Like, he's talking about how difficult marriage is. And the disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But he, Jesus said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it's given. In other words, not everyone can hear what I'm trying to tell you about singleness and how it can actually be more beneficial than marriage. He says, for there are celibates who have been so from birth. In other words, there's those who have never had the desire to get married to someone of the opposite sex ever. And so for whatever reason, uh, he says that they've been that way since birth. 
And then he continues and he says, there are those who have celibate, who, who are celibate, who have been made celibate by men. This group theologians say includes those who are divorced, widowed, or singled, not by choice. They are what we would say today are, are waiting to be married. So there's those from birth who knew that they were not going to get married. And there's those who, for whatever reason, are, are single now. And then there are celibates who have made themselves celibate for the sake of the kingdom of God. In other words, those who have said, I don't know, this isn't my time. It might never be my time, but I'm trusting in God and seeking him above all else. And Jesus finishes by saying, let the one who is able to receive this teaching receive it. Friends, we're not all called to the beautiful, wonderful gift of marriage, and we're not all called to the beautiful, wonderful gift of singleness. You may be single now, and you may know that you're not always called to be single, but let the one who is able to receive this gift receive it. Father, thank you that you've built into creation and even built into things like marriage and singleness, wonderful portraits of you and our relationship with you. And so, Lord, I, I pray for anybody here who may be married and, and is reevaluating their thoughts on singleness. Maybe, they, maybe they, they're married and they've been think, looking down on those who are singled or looking at them as just those who are not yet married instead of realizing that you've beautifully called many men and women to lives of singleness. I pray for those who are single that know that you have called them to lives of singleness and celibacy. And I pray for the difficulty that they face in our over-sexualized over -sexualized culture. But Lord, I pray that you will comfort them and give them a reaffirmation of their calling. And I pray for those, Lord, who are wrestling, really not feeling like you have called them to singleness. Lord, I pray that you will comfort them in their waiting. Lord, that you will encourage them to seek you above all else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing this last song together. Church, we want to put him first in every aspect of our lives because he is so great. He is so good. So let's just focus on him right now. Let's focus on his spirit. Let's just sing out to him. Let's pour out our praise. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart.
no matter where we are in our lives, we want to see you put first. Invade our hearts, invade our spirit. God, we want to see you. We want to know you. You're so good. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. Church, that is our prayer, to put him first before everything. No matter what kind of distraction is in our way, we want to see him being put first. And at the end of the day, all we have is him. Our relationship with him is more important than any other relationship, any other circumstance, any material object that we could have. We want him to be glorified in us. We want him to live through us. So church, we're going to sing that chorus out again. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Sing this out. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. Sing it again. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. Amen. I don't know if you guys know, sometimes one of the the difficult parts of of preaching is as you're preaching the message, you feel the Lord convicting you in your own heart of things that you're proclaiming. And I know that for myself, as I've stood here over the last hour, talking about these words, and after we just sing these words, I'm filled with images in my own mind of things that I do often put before my relationship with Christ. Whether it's great things, marriage, 
and family. Well, there's not great things like Browns or something like that. Like there's areas in all of our lives where, where often we find ourselves putting our preferences and our wants and our desires before our passionate pursuit of following Jesus. And so what I want us to do just for the next few moments or so just is, is silently reflect what is in your life. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your desire to be married. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your pursuit of finances. What often sneaks in between your relationship, between you and the Father? Let's take just a few moments just silently reflecting on that and surrendering that to the Lord. God, we confess individually and corporately that there are times in our lives where we do pursue other things than you. Even the good gifts that you have given us can become idols in our own lives. And so, Lord, we repent. We lay down those idols before you. We don't want anything between ourselves and you, even, even our relationships. Lord, we want to give it all to you because you are great like we just sang about. You've given us the breath in our lungs. The fact that we woke up today is a gift from you. And so, Lord, as we go throughout our lives and there's difficulties and, and struggles and, and, and job difficulties and health difficulties and financial difficulties, Lord, help us to continue to pursue you above all because you are life. Lord, we thank you and we love you it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. I want to give you quickly our key takeaway and our action step, and then we'll close our service by taking the Lord's Supper together. Our key takeaway is this. Singleness matters because God says it's a gift, and singleness matters. Our gospel matters. Okay, singleness matters because God says it's a gift, and singleness matters our gospel matters. Again, there may have been some of us in here who've been married for a long time or even a short time who may have looked like the one quote said as those who are single as just those who are waiting to earn their varsity jacket. But no, singleness matters because God says it's a gift. And then our action step is simply whether married, single, or dating, pursue Christ above all else. Pursue Christ above all else. We're going to take communion together. So if you will, grab that cup and prepare to come to the table together. Good morning, church. Communion is one of those ordinances, sacri sacraments that we've been commanded. It's an imperative that we do for a couple of reasons. Um, Jesus tells us to remember what he did. That's one of the, the big ones. But also the second part is to celebrate corporately what he did. I don't know if you've ever watch the sporting event, a great event alone, it's not the same. I remember when we had a chance to celebrate the 2016 championship here in Cleveland and we were all gathered and a great part of the memory is we celebrate it. And that was just a sporting event. What Jesus has done is so much greater than that. So I want to, as Chase was just talking about, taking a moment to reflect, and I want us to take a moment before we enter into this, because the table coming before the Lord's table is a, should be a very sacred and pure process. So let's take a moment, if there's 
hidden sin, if there's things that we're struggling with, and just continue to lay those things before the Lord so that we come before him with a, with a sense of reverence and a sense of awe. focus on Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and he's reflecting on what Jesus has said, and the first thing as we approach, as I said earlier, in remembering this, this is the way we should approach the table. So as he writes in, beginning in verse 23 of chapter 11, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's drink the cup together. And he concludes this section by saying, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we finish our service today, I'm going to give us a brief benediction, a doxology, if you will, from the book of Jude. And I will say this, if, if there's anyone here who has not given your life, given your all to the sake of Christ, don't leave here. Don't leave here without grabbing a hold of someone. And if you've got questions and you're trying to figure this thing out, don't leave here. Don't go into another day, another week, not having settled the most important aspect in your life. There, there'll never be a greater decision than this. So with that, I conclude with this, and our service and our time will conclude. Jude writes in the 24th verse he's now he says now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen Go in peace.